Today, I, Anupama Pandit Saxena, will be discussing with you a very relevant topic that is the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988, which is also a very important unit of Criminal Law Semester 2nd paper FSHT 201. In Module 5, we will be discussing the important sections of Prevention of Corruption Act. Module 6 will be concluding the session. Let's move on to Module 5. Discussion of the important sections of the Prevention of Corruption Act. In the light of the objectives and important features, some sections of the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 become more relevant to discuss. Starting with Chapter 1, it is important to remember that the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988, according to Section 1, extends to the whole of India except the state of Jammu and Kashmir and it applies also to all citizens of India outside India. Section 2 deals with important definitions of the Act. The first important definition in the Act is Section 2b that is public duty. It means a duty in the discharge of which the state, the public or the community at large has an interest. Section 2c defines public servant means number 1 any person in the service or pay of the government or remunerated by the government by fees or commission for the performance of any public duty. Number 2 any person in the service or pay of a local authority. Three, any person in the service or pay of a corporation established by or under a central provincial or state act or an authority or a body owned or controlled or aided by the government or a government company as defined in section 617 of the Companies Act 1956. 4. Any judge including any person empowered by law to discharge whether by himself or as a member of any body of persons any adjudicatory function. 5. Any person authorized by a court of justice to perform any duty in connection with the administration of justice including a liquidator, receiver or commissioner appointed by such court. 6. Any arbitrator or other person to whom any cause or matter has been referred for decision or report by court of justice or by a competent public authority. Number seven, any person who holds an office by virtue of which he is empowered to prepare, publish, maintain or revise an electoral roll or to conduct an election or part of an election. Number eight, any person who holds an office by virtue of which he is authorized or required to perform any public duty. 9. Any person who is the president, secretary or other office bearer of a registered cooperative society engaged in agriculture, industry, trade or banking, receiving or having received any financial aid from the central government or a state government or from any corporation established by or under a central provincial or state act or any authority or body owned or controlled or aided by the government or a government company as defined in section 617 of the Companies Act 1956. 10. Any person who is a chairman, member of employee of any service commission or board by whatever name called or a member of any selection committee appointed by such commission or board for the conduct of any examination or making any selection on behalf of such commission or board. 11. Any person who is a vice chancellor or member of any governing body, professor, reader, lecturer or any other teacher or employee by whatever designation called of any university and any person whose services have been availed by a university or any other public authority in connection with holding or conducting examinations. 12. Any person who is an office bearer or an employee of an educational, scientific, social, cultural or other institution 
in whatever manner established receiving or having received any financial assistance from the central government or any state government or local or other public authority the explanation says persons falling under any of the above sub clauses are public servants whether appointed by the government or not explanation 2 says wherever the word public servant occur they shall be understood of every person who is in actual possession of the situation of a public servant whatever legal defect there may be in his right to hold that situation so this section covers 12 categories of persons irrespective of the fact whether they have been appointed by government or not they are under preview of the definition of public servant in the very famous case of p v narsimha rao versus state 1998 criminal law journal 2930 a five judge bench of the apex court laid down that a member of parliament holds an office and by virtue of such office he is required or authorized to perform public duties and such duties are in the nature of public duties this case explains both the terms public duty and public servant now let's move on to chapter 2 that deals with appointment of special judges section 3 power to appoint special judges the central government or the state government may by notification in the official gazette appoint as many special judges as may be necessary for each area or areas or for such case or group of cases as may be specified in the notification to try the following offenses namely a any offense punishable under this act any conspiracy to commit or any attempt to commit or any abatement of any of the offenses specified in clause a subsection 2 says a person shall not be qualified for appointment as a special judge under this act unless he is or has been a sessions judge or an additional sessions judge or an assistant sessions judge under the code of criminal procedure 1973 section 4 says about cases tribal by special judges according to this section the offenses specified in subsection 1 of section 3 shall be tried by special judges only it further provides that special judge shall as far as practicable hold the trial of an offense on day to day basis section 5 procedure and powers of a special judge as per this section a special judge may take cognizance of offense without the accused being committed to him for trial and in trying the accused persons shall follow the procedure prescribed by the code of criminal procedure 1973 for the trial of warrant cases by magistrates it further states that a special judge may pass upon any person convicted by him any sentence authorized by law for the punishment of the offense of which such person is convicted section 6 power to try summarily this section empowers the special judge to try the offense in a summary way and the provisions of the section 262 to 265 of the criminal procedure code 1973 shall as far as may be apply to such trial provided that in the case of any conviction in a summary trial under this section it shall be lawful for the special judge to pass a sentence of imprisonment for a term not exceeding 1 year provided further that when at the commencement of or in the course of a summary trial under this section it appears to the special judge that the nature of the case is such that a sentence of imprisonment for a term exceeding 1 year may have to be passed special judge shall after hearing the parties record an order to that effect and thereafter recall any witnesses who may have been examined and proceed to hear or rehear the case in the accordance with the procedure 
prescribed by the said code for the trial of warrant cases by magistrate chapter 3 it deals with offenses and penalties this is the most important chapter of the prevention of corruption act 1988 so we will discuss all the sections of this chapter section 7 public servant taking gratification other than legal remuneration in respect of an official act whoever being or expecting to be a public servant accepts or obtains or agrees to accept or attempts to obtain from any person for himself or for any other person any gratification whatever other than legal remuneration as a motive or reward for doing or for bearing to do any official act or for showing or for bearing to show in the exercise of his official functions favor or disfavor to any person or for rendering or attempting to render any service or disservice to any person with the central government or any state government or parliament or the legislature of any state or with any local authority corporation or government company referred to in clause c of section 2 or with any public servant whether named or otherwise shall be punished with imprisonment which shall be not less than 3 years but which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine explanation a expecting to be a public servant if a person not expecting to be in office obtains a gratification by deceiving others into a belief that he is about to be in office and that he will then serve them b may be guilty of cheating but he is not guilty of the offense defined in this section explanation b explains gratification the word gratification is not restricted to pecuniary gratification or to gratification estimable in money c legal remuneration the words legal remuneration are not restricted to remuneration which a public servant can lawfully demand but includes all remuneration which he is permitted by the government or the organization which he serves to accept d a motive or reward for doing a person who receives a gratification as a motive or reward for do doing what he does not intend or he is not in a position to do or has not done comes within this expression e where a public servant induces a person erroneously to believe that his influence with the government has obtained a title for that person and thus induces the person to give the public servant money or any other gratification as a reward for their service the public servant has committed an offense under this section section 8 taking gratification in order by corrupt or illegal means to influence public servant whoever accepts or obtains or agrees to accept or attempts to obtain from any person for himself or for any other person any any gratification whatever as a motive or reward for inducing by corrupt or illegal means any public servant whether named or otherwise to do or to forbear to do any official act or in the exercise of the official functions of such public servant to show favor or disfavor to any person or to render or attempt to render any service or this service to any person with the central government or any state government or parliament or the legislature of any state or with any local authority corporation or government company referred to in clause c of section 2 or with any public servant whether named or otherwise shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than 3 years but which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine 
section 9 taking gratification for exercise of personal influence with public servant whoever accepts or obtains or agrees to accept or attempts to obtain from any person for himself or for any other person any gratification whatever as a motive or reward for inducing by the exercise of personal influence any public servant whether named or otherwise to do to forbear to do any official act or in the exercise of the official function of such public servant to show favor or disfavor to any person or to render or attempt to render any service or disservice to any person with the central government or any state government or parliament or the legislature of any state or with any local authority corporation or government company referred to in clause c of section 2 or with any public servant whether named or otherwise shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than three years but which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine section 10 punishment for abatement by public servant of offenses defined in section 8 or 9 whoever bearing a public servant in respect of whom either of the offenses defined in section 8 or section 9 is committed abates the offense whether or not that offense is committed in consequence of that abatement shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than six months but which may extend to five years and shall also be liable to fine section 11 public servant obtaining valuable thing without consideration from person concerned in proceeding or business transacted by such public servant whoever being a public servant accepts or obtains or agree to accept or attempts to obtain for himself or for any other person any valuable thing without consideration or for a consideration which he knows to be inadequate from any person whom he knows to have been or to be or to be likely to be concerned in any proceeding or business transacted or about to be transacted by such public servant or having any connection with the official functions of himself or any public servant to whom he is subordinate or from any person whom he knows to be entrusted in or related to the person so concerned shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than six months but which may extend to five years and shall also be liable to fine section 12 punishment for abatement of offenses defined in section 7 or section 11 whoever abates any offense punishable under section 7 or section 11 whether or not that offense is committed in consequence of that abatement shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than three years but which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine section 13 criminal misconduct by a public servant a public servant is set to commit the offense of criminal misconduct a if he habitually accepts or obtains or agree to accept or attempts to obtain from any person for himself or for any other person any gratification other than legal remuneration as a motive or reward such as is mentioned in section 7 or b if he habitually accepts or obtains or agree to accept or attempt to obtain for himself or for any other person any valuable thing without consideration or for a consideration which he knows to be inadequate from any person whom he knows to have been or to be or to be likely to be concerned in any proceeding or business transacted or about to be transacted by him or having any connection with the official functions of himself or of any public servant to whom he is subordinate or from any person whom he knows to be interested or related to the person so concerned or c 
if he dishonestly or fraudulently misappropriates or otherwise converts for his own use any property entrusted to him or under his control as a public servant or allows any other person to do so or d if he number 1 by corrupt or legal means obtains for himself or for any other person any valuable thing or pecuniary advantage or number 2 by abusing his position as a public servant obtains for himself or for any other person any valuable thing or pecuniary advantage or number 3 while holding office as a public servant obtains for any person any valuable thing or pecuniary advantage without any public interest e if he or any person on his behalf is in possession or has at any time during the period of his office been in possession for which the public servant cannot satisfactorily account of pecuniary resources or property disproportionate to his known sources of income exploitation for the purpose of this section known sources of income means income received from any lawful source and such receipt has been intimated in accordance with the provisions of any law rules or orders for the time being applicable to a public servant subsection 2 says any public servant who commits criminal misconduct shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than 4 years but which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine section 14 habitual committing of offense under section 8 9 and 12 whoever habitually commits an offense punishable under section 8 or section 9 or an offense punishable under section 12 shall be punishable with the imprisonment for a term which shall be not less than 5 years but which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine section 15 punishment for attempt whoever attempts to commit an offense referred to in clause c or clause d of subsection 1 of section 13 shall be punishable with imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 2 years which may extend to 5 years and with fine section 16 matters to be taken into consideration for fixing fine where a sentence of fine is imposed under subsection 2 of section 13 or section 14 the court in fixing the amount of the fine shall take into consideration the amount or the value of the property if any which the accused person has obtained by committing the offense or where the conviction is for an offense referred to in clause e of subsection 1 of section 13 the pecuniary resources or property referred to in the clause for which the accused person is unable to account satisfactorily investigation into cases under the act section 17 persons authorized to investigate notwithstanding anything contained in the code of criminal procedure 1973 no police officer below the rank a in case of the delhi special police establishment of an inspector of police in the metropolitan area of bombay calcutta madras and ahmedabad and in any other metropolitan area notified as such under subsection 1 of section 8 of the code of criminal procedure 1973 of an assistant commissioner of police elsewhere of a deputy superintendent of police or a police officer of equivalent rank shall investigate any offence punishable under this act without the order of a metropolitan magistrate or a magistrate of the first class as the case may be or make any arrest there for without a warrant provided that if a police officer not below the rank of an inspector of police is authorized by the state government in this behalf by general or special order he may also investigate any such offence without the order of a metropolitan magistrate 
or a magistrate of first class as the case may be or make arrest there for without a warrant provided further that an offence referred to in clause E of subsection 1 of section 13 shall not be investigated without the order of a police officer not below the rank of the superintendent of police. Section 18. Power to inspect banker's book. This section provides for the power of the police officer to inspect banker's books but no power under this section in relation to the accounts of any person shall be exercised by a police officer below the rank of the superintendent of police unless he is especially authorized in this behalf by a police officer of or above the rank of superintendent of police. Chapter 5 Sanction for prosecution and other miscellaneous provisions. Section 19 Previous sanction necessary for prosecution. This section provides that the previous sanction of the competent authority is necessary for prosecution. Section 20 Presumption where public servant accepts gratification other than legal remuneration. This section provides for the presumption but the provision also says that the court may decline to draw the presumption if the gratification or thing aforesaid is in its opinion so trivial that no inference of corruption may fairly be drawn. Section 21 Accused person to be a competent witness. Any person charged with an offence punishable under this act shall be a competent witness for the defence and may give evidence on oath in disproof of the charges made against him or any person charged together with him at the same trial provided that a he shall not be called as a witness except at his own request b his failure to give evidence shall not be made the subject of any comment by the prosecution or give rise to any presumption against himself or any person charged together with him at the same trial. C. He shall not be asked and if asked shall not be required to answer any question tending to show that he has committed or been convicted of any offence other than the offence with which he is charged or is of bad character unless number 1. The proof that he has committed or been convicted of such offence is admissible evidence to show that he is guilty of the offence with which he is charged or he has personally or by his pleader asked any question of any witness for the prosecution with a view to establish his own good character or has given evidence of his good character or the nature or conduct of the defence is such as to involve imputations on the character of the prosecutor or any witness for the prosecution or he has given evidence against any other person charged with the same offence. Section 22 The Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 to apply subject to certain modifications. Section 23 Particulars in a charge in relation to an offence under section 13.1c. It says when an accused is charged with an offence under clause c of subsection 1 of section 13 it shall be sufficient to describe in the charge the property in respect of which the offence is alleged to have been committed and the dates between which the offence is alleged to have been committed without specifying particular items or exact dates. And the charge so framed shall be deemed to be a charge of one offence within the meaning of section 219 of the Criminal Procedure Code, provided that the time included between first and last of such dates shall not exceed one year. Section 24. Statement by bribe giver not to subject him to prosecution. This section protects the bribe giver against prosecution. It is debated that this protection should be removed. As we have discussed earlier, the position may change once the Prevention of Corruption Amendment Bill 2008 
2013 is passed. Section 25, military, navy and air force or other law not to be affected. Section 26, special judges appointed under Criminal Law Amendment Act 1952 to be special judges appointed under this act. Section 27 tells us about appeal and revision. Subject to the provision of this act, the High Court may exercise so far as they may be applicable all the powers of appeal and revision conferred by the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 on a High Court as if the Court of Special Judge were a Court of Session trying cases within the local limit of the High Court. Section 28 Act to be in addition to any other law. The provisions of this Act shall be in addition to and not in derogation of any other law for the time being in force and nothing contained herein shall exempt any public servant from any proceeding which might apart from this act be instituted against him. Section 29 Amendment of the Ordinance 38 of 1944 Now Section 33 is repeal and saving the Prevention of Corruption Act 1947 and the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1952 are hereby repealed. Notwithstanding such repeal, but without prejudice to the application of Section 6 of the General Clauses Act 1897, anything done or any action taken or purports to have been done or taken under or in pursuance of the acts so repealed shall in so far as it is not, not inconsistent with the provisions of this act be deemed to have been done or taken under or in pursuance of the corresponding provisions of this act. <music> Module 6 Conclusion Corruption threatens the rule of law, democracy and human rights. It undermines good governance, fairness and social justice distorts competition, hinders economic development and endangers the stability of democratic institutions and moral foundations of any society. In India, corruption is an issue that adversely affects the country's economy and credibility of central, state and local government agencies. Not only has it held the economy back from reaching new heights, but this rampant corruption has also stunned India's development. Some people say corruption is an intractable problem. It is like diabetes. It can only be controlled, but not totally eliminated. It may not be possible to root out corruption completely at all levels, but it is possible to contain it within tolerable limits. Honest and dedicated person in public life, control over electoral expenses could be the most important prescriptions to combat corruption. Corruption has a coercive impact on our economy. It worsens our image in international market and leads to loss of overseas opportunities. So, it is clear that the problem is grave but we have to find out the solutions. The Transparency International Organization suggested some solutions. It says that there is no silver bullet for fighting corruption. However, here are five ways that citizens and government can make progress in the fight against corruption. These five ways are number one, end impunity. For that, effective law enforcement is essential to ensure the corrupt are punished and break the cycle of impunity or freedom from punishment or loss. Number two, reform public administration and finance management. Number three, promote transparency and access to information. Number four, empower citizens. For example, community monitoring initiatives have in some cases contributed to the detection of corruption reduced leakages of funds and improved the quality and quantity of public services. 
The fifth solution which is suggested by the Transparency International Organization is to close international loopholes because without access to the international financial system, corrupt public officials throughout the world would not be able to launder and hide the proceeds of looted state assets. Thus, it is clear that both citizens and government together have to take measures to combat corruption. We often blame the government for their failure in checking corruption, but it is time to realize that it is more a question of public morality, of individual conscience and initiative than efficient administration to eradicate corruption. We need to understand that we are the main solution for corruption. If we all stand against this evil, our dream of corruption-free developed country will soon come true. Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam said, if we cannot make India corruption-free, then the vision of making the nation develop by 2020 will remain as a dream. So it is clear that for making India a developed nation, eradication of corruption is a must. With all this information, we come to the end of today's lecture. Now that you all have a fair idea about anti-corruption laws in India, I am sure that your moral to fight against corruption is a little more lifted up. So keep it up. Do remember what we discussed today. It is time for you all to do some self-study. This is Anupama Pandit Saxena signing off. If you want to learn more and enhance your knowledge, you may log on to our website for MCQ, quizzes, LORs. The website is www.cec.nic.in. I will again meet you in another session with more learning lectures in coming episode. So till then, keep learning. Thank you very much.